Well, I've taken you to Canada, to Guantanamo Bay, but this time it really looks like I've pulled the short straw because I'm here in the Motor City. Welcome to Detroit. Detroit, it's become a bit of a punchline in this country, but you have to ask yourself, how did one of the wealthiest cities in the country become this? Detroit used to be the city with the highest median household income of anywhere in the country, and now it ranks 66th out of 68. It also has some of the highest crime rates, unemployment rate, and the lowest graduation rates of anywhere in the USA. In a nutshell, Detroit sucks. But why? Oh, that's why. I forgot. Well, to start, it's no secret that Detroit is run entirely by leftists. Every single mayor of Detroit since 1961 has been a liberal. It is the city of entitlement programs. Leftists always tout their policies as a way to help the poor and give our fellow man a leg up. Well, how's that working out for them? And how did it get this way? It all started with Mayor Jerome Cavanaugh, elected in 1961. He expanded the role of government in Detroit to an unprecedented level, particularly under President Lyndon Johnson's presidency with the Model Cities Program. What's that? You've never heard of the Model Cities Program? Well, I'll show you. I'll show you. Now, the Model Cities Program is considered by many to be the first great step in central urban planning. Um, what happened was they pumped $400 million into a nine mile square radius of Detroit, the area that you see here, in order to make it an exemplary city for the rest of the USA to follow. And of course that sort of set a trend in motion where Detroit ended up getting hundreds of dollars in every single federal bailout loan or grant that you can possibly imagine. Uh, really, Detroit is the poster boy for leftist policies at work. Now clearly they didn't succeed in creating a model city but uh, the government did succeed in creating an entirely state-dependent city, which many people think was their goal in the first place. And uh, that allowed the government to tell people in this city what they could build, where they could build it, which businesses would stay open, which businesses would close. And of course, in exchange for that stringent government control, they promised them things like education, training, health care, more entitlement programs. It smells funny. Speaking of education, how do Detroit schools stack up? Uh, there certainly isn't any lack of funding here in Detroit. As students of Detroit receive, on average, $11,100 per student. Compare that to the national average of $9,600, yet Detroit students enjoy a graduation rate of actually 25%. And a sad fact of the matter is that a student of Detroit has a higher chance of ending up in prison than graduating high school. And you have to ask yourself, well, how have the oh-so-powerful teachers unions of Detroit's failed the students? Uh, the truth is they have been refusing to bend on policies for years that would benefit the students, including merit-based pay, uh, increased teacher-to-student ratios, uh, giving incentives to better teachers, or of course the school choice program that we've spoken about here at PJTV and has been a tremendous success wherever it's been implemented across the country. Could it be that the teachers unions aren't really designed to help the students, but the unions? Of course, public education isn't the only place in Detroit where unions get to flex their power. Also, plants and factories like these are what made the big three American auto companies, uh, Detroit, the envy of the rest of the industrialized world for so long. After World War II, cars were being produced rapidly, people were buying, and Detroit was prosperous. Which makes you wonder what happened. It's no secret that uh, American auto companies have required federal bailout after bailout, and liberal politicians will tell you that that is because of poor management and not enough fuel-efficient cars. They'll say that when the gas prices rose, the economy crashed, and people wanted smaller, more fuel-efficient cars. Uh, mismanagement, that may be, that very well may be true, but uh, not enough green cars? GM alone offered more gas-efficient cars than Honda or Toyota. As a matter of fact, they had more in their lineup than any car company on the market. Americans still didn't buy those cars, however, as the number one selling car in the country is still... the F-150. Actually, out of the top ten selling cars in the U.S., four of them were trucks or SUVs, with only two officially being categorized as compacts. Now, I know what you're thinking, but Stephen, those are just good gas cars. What about the hybrids? Good question. American automakers have more of those, too. 
Not only do people not buy them as displayed by all hybrids accounting for a total 2% of the market share, but when people do buy them, it doesn't make these companies any money. When it comes to experimental cars, both Ford and GM have admitted to having years of bleeding red ink ahead. Honda hasn't fared much better. Even the most successful hybrid car, the Prius, is still widely believed by analysts to be losing money on each one sold, according to the Washington Post. But if it's not the lack of green cars that made American car makers so crappy, what was it? Enter the United Auto Workers Union. Even under tough economic conditions, concessions are never a part of the UAW's vocabulary. Fully aware of the fact that their company will go bankrupt under these conditions, the UAW still made sure that they received seven weeks paid vacation each year, maintain job banks, meaning that UAW workers rarely, if ever, actually get fired. They're simply sent to job banks where they are paid nearly full wages not to work. How's that for job security? Get their $74 an hour wage in both salary and benefits. Compare that to the $42 an hour for a comparable Japanese company auto worker or even $26 in the private sector. The cost, of course, includes some of the most luxurious healthcare coverage offered on the planet, covering not only hospital, surgical, and drug coverage, but extravagances such as hearing aids and LASIK eye surgery. So with every car you buy, you're paying an additional $1,200 in employee benefits that you wouldn't be paying with the competition. American made. All this adds up to the average UAW worker earning $130,000 a year in wages and benefits, and GM alone has had to pay over $100 billion in retiree health care costs in the last 15 years alone. And there's no end in sight, as they'll need to pay another $47 billion in the near future. There it is, folks. While you and your family buckle down to plow through these tough economic times, the labor of the UAW continue to live like kings and make virtually no compromises. After all, why would they if the federal government just keeps bailing them out? And why wouldn't the federal government keep bailing them out when it's the unions who elect them? Guess just how much of the UAW's political contributions were donated to conservative or Republican candidates in 2008? A whopping 0%. One of the big ironies in all of this is that liberal environmentalists support the unions because the unions elect them. But because the UAW labor costs are so high, it dissuades automakers from investing in lower profit margin smaller cars, so they instead focus on larger vehicles and SUVs. That's right, folks. The UAW is bad for the environment. So the UAW runs the auto industry into the ground, and the teachers' unions run education into the ground. So what happens to Detroit as a whole? Good people leave, poverty rises, and so does crime. Unemployment is at 28% in Detroit right now, and the murder rate is over five times that of the national average. Actually, seven out of 10 murders go completely unsolved. So if you want to kill someone, head on down to Detroit. Not only that, but the average price of a home in Detroit is now around $5,700. Sound hard to believe? Not when you see what many of them look like. You can see here you've got present separations. You've got capability. You've got gasoline. And five bottles of antifreeze. Um, antifreeze is the main ingredient used in meth. Freshly eaten chip bags, uh, beer cans, Wendy's cups. This is not, this is not, someone is living here, so we should probably get going. At least they put up some uh, Christmas decorations to spread some Christmas cheer, so the people still seem to be in good spirits. <laughs> Someone's missing a glove. And down in the basement if you want. We have a nice two story in the Detroit area. Cozy. Rustic. Oh, look at this. Come on. Come here. 
I wonder if anything untoward is going on here. <laughs> you ever see the movie Four Brothers with Mark Wahlberg? After Andre 5000, they get shot up in the house. This looks like that post-shooting. Look at this right here. These are fresh syringes. Oh, actually, look at this. Get a shot of all this. This whole thing. Look right here. We've got packs and packs of syringes here. Now, as you can see, that actually, this area of land would have been an extra probably 20 homes in Detroit, and they've either burned down or just been destroyed. And uh, these huge barren sections of land, they're all over the place in Detroit, so what's actually started popping up are things called urban farms, where people actually build miniature farms right here in the city uh, to grow food for themselves. And you know, like I said, I mean, it's so desolate. There have actually been bear sightings in the city of Detroit, too. Uh, just another problem that they don't need here in Detroit. You got the wild dogs, now you got the bears. Maybe you'll see a wild dog and bear fight, and we'll get this on Discovery. That's what I'm hoping for. That's my next career shift. Now you might be wondering why I've shown you this. Why is it necessary for you to see a once great city brought to its knees by government bureaucracies and powerful unions? And to you I would ask, to look at the current administration, look at this administration's promises to the American people and compare them to the promises of corrupt Detroit politicians over the last 50 years. They're nearly identical. Detroit has been the perfect laboratory for leftist policies at work for nearly half a century. It's, it's the perfect vision of the left utopia that this administration sees. And when you continue to remove free market principles that have made this country great, and you continue to create a state-dependent society, this is very well what America could look like in a very short amount of time. And, uh, and I think that's important. If there's one way to describe the aura of Detroit, it would be that of hopelessness. The city's citizens have been robbed of the American dream by politicians and bureaucrats upstream. They've been promised the world, but have been left with this. So I ask you, is this the America you want?